Hi, I'm Mike Villar, and today we're going to do our first uh, Villar for Prosecutor podcast. Joining me today is uh, Kevin Travis, who's the Watson Township Supervisor. But just a quick uh, word of introduction for myself. Uh, I've been an attorney here in Allegan for 33 years. I started as a law clerk for Judge Corsilia uh, for a year, and then I went on to the Michigan Court of Appeals for a year. Since that time, I've been, uh, I started my own private practice, and I've been doing that ever since. I have also owned commercial buildings and still own commercial buildings in town, so I'm a businessman here in town. I raised four kids uh, in Allegan, and during that time, I was able to coach ASO soccer, uh, Little League baseball, and some AAU girls basketball. So I'm, I've been fairly involved in our community, and I love our community, um, and so that's uh, part of what has motivated me to run for prosecutor again. I ran four years ago, and I lost uh, by 17 votes out of 18,000, and I hope that that does not happen again. I hope that we win by a substantial margin, and uh, that's what I'm hoping to do and hoping to have people come out on August 6th, which is the primary, and vote for me. But today we have Kevin Travis with us, and Kevin, why don't you give us a word of introduction about yourself? Thanks. Um, I've actually been an attorney in Allegan County for just over 10 years was actually sworn in here in Allegan County. So my name is in the official book across the street in the courthouse. Um, I clerked with Judge Cronin for 18 months and uh, decided to run for public office, kind of uh, try to follow Judge's uh, footsteps a little bit. Uh, as a public servant, uh, he was a supervisor in Hopkins for a while and uh, ran for office. Yeah, I didn't know that about uh, Judge Cronin. Yes, yeah, he he was... Uh, he. he uh, Famously, uh, uh, you know, didn't have many office hours sometimes. It was hard to get a hold of, <laughs> kind of like as, as a judge. But I love Judge Cronin. He's a great man. He's, st he's still around, and I still serve with him on the Wayland Ambulance Board. Good. And, um, and so it's – so I, I do take a lot of uh, pride in this community. Um, I do have three kids of, of my own. Uh, two of them go to Hopkins, and my oldest son goes to the autism program in Otsego. So, and I remember four years ago, you supported me, and uh, I've always appreciated that. So thank you for that. Yeah, and, and and you you brought up the fact that you only lost by 17 votes, and because I supported you so strongly in the in the prosecutor's race uh, primary last year. My f my township was a heavy focus of your opponent's campaign last year, so there were some last minute letters that went out to uh, people that tend to vote in primaries and just in my township. Uh, and there are a lot of signs by your opponent. And I think you still got seventy three percent of the vote in Watson Township, well, despite those efforts. And I think a lot of that was your was your effort. So I appreciate that. So this today, I, one of the things I'd like to talk about is my opponent. Um, she has been a prosecu the prosecuting attorney for the last six years. During that last six years, uh, she's now developed a record that she has to run on, and I think that's unfortunate for her because her record uh, is not that good. And, and by the way, if you have anything to, to add, just jump in. Yeah. Uh, but six years, six years ago, her budget was $1.2 million dollars. And this year, it is $2.1 million. So we've almost had a doubling of the budget. Uh, when she got into her office, when she got into becoming the prosecutor, she was appointed first by Marge Baker, then she won a temporary election. Um, she had eight assistant prosecuting attorneys. And at the time, uh, I knew all of those prosecutors. They were all really good prosecutors. And um, since, in the last six years, she has now lost 18 assistant prosecutors. 18 assistant prosecutors have quit to go on to other jobs. And um, she's indicated that they're going on to higher jobs, but they're not. A lot of them are going on to lesser paying jobs or similar jobs farther away from home. In addition to the 18 that have quit, one was fired. So there's been a turnover of 19 assistant prosecutors in the last uh, six years. And when people ask me about that, uh, I tell them that's a huge problem in terms of your institutional knowledge that those prosecutors lost when they left they had years and years of experience they knew the they knew the judges they knew the law clerks when you were a law clerk you knew those guys um when uh when they leave they knew the, the police officers 
They knew the defense attorneys who you could trust and who you couldn't trust. So they had a vast amount of institutional knowledge, and, th and they're gone. It's gone now. And as a result of that, in the last uh, just last week, um, the Allegan Prosecutor's Office won their first district court trial of 2024. They were 0 for 2024 until last week, and uh, so that's an atrocious record. Um, in circuit court, they're they're winning about half of their trials. So that's also not a very good record. District court is for misdemeanors. Circuit court is for, for felonies. So they've they've uh, while their budget has ballooned, um, their results have kind of plummeted. Um, so one of the things that was interesting when you were you were a law clerk for Judge Cronin, right? Yes, sir. And he he ultimately retired, right? Yes, he was essentially tired of the garbage he was exposed to. So he, when he retired, then at that point there was a Republican governor, Governor Snyder. Yes. And when a, when a when a judge retires, their their uh, successor is picked by the governor, and it was Governor Snyder at that point. C correct. Yes. And uh, were you still his law clerk when he retired? Uh, no, no. Um, You've gone on. I had gone on uh, probably a good year in. Uh, it was really when when Deb Mead decided to hang it up. Uh, that's when uh, Judge decided to hang it up as and, well. And Deb Mead was a secretary, his secretary, and she had been Judge Beach's secretary for years and years. Yes, and Judge Blardron's secretary as yep. well, and, and okay. uh, so she had a, a vast amount of institutional knowledge yep. and. And that's why institutional knowledge is important. Um, so when and when Judge Cronin quit, um, what generally happens is the the people that want to be judges put in an application, and those people are then um, interviewed. Uh, they have some investigation that goes on, and then the governor picks people to interview to for the for the new for the spot to replace. And if you do get that, if the governor does pick you, you have to run at the next election to confirm the rest of the term. So the reason I'm saying all this is six years ago when Judge Cronin quit, um, my opponent put her name in for the prosecutor, for the uh, judge's spot. So she put her name in along with Judge Kingis. And Judge Kingis was her boss at that time. Judge Kingis was the elected prosecutor at the time. Um, and my opponent was just an assistant prosecuting attorney. So she, she tried to get a job as judge to become judge. Uh, ultimately, um, Governor Snyder picked uh, Rob Kingus. And it was after that point that Marge Baker, who was the only circuit court judge, I think at the time, appointed Myrene Cook as the prosecuting attorney. Um, so let's fast forward in time to this last year. Judge Kingus uh, was judge for about four and a half, five years, and he unexpectedly quit in 2023. And uh, so, again, Myrene Cook decided to put her name in for judge again. Only this time, the, the, it was a little different because we have Gretchen Whitmer. Uh, so she put her name in uh, one more time, and I think uh, if we can put up the one uh, graphic uh, where she does admit she applied both times in 2018 and 2020, uh, 2023. So she applied both times, and uh, I'm not sure exactly why she, well, what's your opinion on whether or not a Democratic governor would appoint a Republican prosecutor? Well, I, I think my, well, my opinion is that she's an opportunist. She's, it's, it doesn't really matter what political party uh, she calls herself. So long as she has power, and my any inter interaction that I've had with her is she's very much a power hungry person, and she craves and delights in power. And you're talking about Myrene. Yes, I am talking about Myrene. Well, I I think that it was uh, it was a far cry of it was a real high expectation to believe that a Democratic governor would appoint a Republican prosecutor uh, to be the next judge, and in fact that didn't happen. She did not get an interview at this point. But I think one of the interesting things that it, sh it tells me is that even before she became the prosecutor, she was trying to become a judge in 2018. And now that she's become the prosecutor, she, the first opportunity she gets, she tries to become a judge again. 
So she tried to become judge under Jim, uh, under uh, uh, Governor Snyder, and now she's tried to become judge under Gretchen Whitmer. And I think the fairest um, thing you can say about that is that she doesn't really want to be the prosecutor. She's using the prosecutor position as a stepping stone to try to get to that next step. And, and that's, that's how I see her ambition. Uh, people, you, you saw the editorial I wrote in 2020. And in 2020, I said that um, my opponent was overcharging felonies, clogging up the court system, uh, not being tougher on crime, but just clogging up the court system so that a new judgeship could be created. And uh, I predicted that in 2020 in the Holland Sentinel. I, I wrote the editorial. I think you read it. And, um, and so what's happened is that's, in fact, what has happened. Now, Allegan, through the, pro the, the Board of Commissioners, approved, kind of in the middle of the night, I didn't hear anything about it. Next thing you know, Allegan has approved a new circuit court judgeship. And that circuit court judgeship comes at a significant cost to the county because now you're going to have to pay the part of the judge's salary. Then you're going to have to pay a law clerk and the secretary. And you're going to have to then create a courthouse for that judge. And, of course, I think we did... Eight million, seven point eight million, is that right? Something like that. And and I do have some insight as far as like how that process should look in a normal county. Yeah. So I was a management analyst in in Kent County, uh, and the county board in Kent County was asked if they would like to add another judgeship. Now keep in mind the state legislature had already approved Kent County to have a judgeship because the way the process works is scale does now uh, you, you have to explain what scale is yes scale is the state court administrator's office they're basically the bean counters of the legal world okay and the bean counters of the legal world decided that at the time kent county their caseload was such that they should have another judge so they get with the with the state legislature and the state legislature passes essentially an enabling act uh to allow a county to have an additional judgeship and so the, uh, the 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 legislature passed uh, a, a judiciary act amendment essentially to allow Kent County to have some additional judgeships. And Kent County, when I was there at the time, they absolutely did not want another judgeship, even though they were allowed to have one, because the cost of building out. Uh, so in the Kent County courthouse at the time even though they had this beautiful brand new building downtown uh, that's uh, I think 12 stories high there was a story in that building that was completely unfinished so in the public area it looked finished the hallways and the elevators and so forth but you go in the back rooms and the courtrooms were completely not built out and it was going to cost many many millions of dollars at the time and and Kent County I think being a truly a f more of a fiscally conservative uh, county, they said, absolutely not. We're not going to spend the money until there's really an absolute need. Yep. And in this process, in, in the process in Allegan County, uh, it was completely flipped on its head. The county asked the state legislature for another judgeship. Very curious. Very yeah. odd. Well, from my understanding is that the, the state court administrator's office approved another district court judgeship, and Judge Scotchless, who was the chief, um, the chief judge of the district court at the time, said, no, we don't need it. And then the, uh, the county said, no, we'll take a circuit court judgeship. And, uh, that, and they tried to get it through the legislature quickly, and, judge, uh, and uh, Governor Whitmer didn't sign it right away. Or Governor Snyder, I'm sorry, didn't sign it right away. I can't remember. I think it was Whitmer. But anyway, the, the bottom line is that now we have another judgeship. And now this coming November, uh, well, in August there's a primary, so there's three, currently there's three candidates uh, for circuit court judge. And in August it will be whittled down to two. And in November voters will pick the new circuit court judge. Um, and, and when that happens, that judge is going to be put into a new courtroom which is at a cost of $7.8 million. They're, they're adding on to the Allegan County Courthouse right now. And so we are going to be incurring those costs for the next forever, basically. 
Um, and so people have asked me when I said when I said six, you know four years ago that that Myrene was going to want to pick that job or want to get one of those, and they they'll ask me, well, why didn't she run this time? And the answer is actually pretty simple. Uh, this year she's up for re-election as prosecutor. Uh, I hope that she doesn't make it, uh, and that's my goal. But I think from her perspective, she did not want to give up her job as prosecutor to, to, to go after a judgeship that was uncertain. So in two more years, she knows that there are two judges in Allegan County that are going to be gone. Um, Judge Scotchless ha is timed out and Judge Baker have, are going to be timed out in two years. So for people that are, are listening, in, in Michigan, after you reach age 70, you cannot run again. So we have two judges. We have a district court judge and we have a circuit court judge that are both going to be retiring, uh, and be forced to retire in two years. And I think that my opponent knows that. And it can. And in two years from now, if, if the things go according to her plan, she can win re-election as prosecutor and then run for judge without risking her job. So I think that's why she's done it. But I think the thing that I want to impress upon everybody here is that from even before she became the official prosecutor, she's wanted to be a judge. And there's another uh, article that I that I, I wanted to post uh, on the on the site. Uh, the next one, yeah, uh, on May 19th of 2023, um, my opponent put out a um, an announcement that she has applied for the 48th Circuit Court judicial vacancy, and she's praying to be where she's needed the most as a judge or as the prosecutor. And I think by the fact that every time there's been an open judgeship, she's applied for it. I think that that is where she wants to be, and that's where her heart is. And I think in, in, in some ways, that's partly why her performance as a prosecutor has been so lacking, is that her heart isn't in it. I think that's an astute observation. Well, that's, that's my first point. I think that uh, she's, she's, not, she's somebody who doesn't really want to keep on as a prosecutor. And, and for me... I want to make our county a better place. And, and so we've had some really bad times in the last six years, and it's gotten worse and worse every year. So the more that her record is develops, the worse it gets. So, so for example, and we're going to move into what I think is election interference. Um, last week, in the last two weeks, we've had two more prosecutors put in their two-week notice. And... One of them is going to the Kalamazoo Prosecutor's Office, and one of them was going to go to Ottawa County Prosecutor's Office. Uh, now, to give you a little bit of background, uh, you know who Jim Story is, right? Oh, yeah. And who is he? He is the board chairman for the County Board of Commissioners and the, a little campaign helper for Myron Cook. He was also a campaign manager or helper for Judge Baker, is that right, when that, she ran? yes. Um, so, and then, and as far as I know, Allegan County doesn't have a conflict of interest policy. So you can, you can actually be a campaign manager for someone and then vote on their budget. Unfortunately, yes. And in fact, that's what's happened in the last six years. Uh, while Mr. Story is not just a board of commissioners, he's the head of the board of commissioners. The last six years, he's voted on Myron Cook's budget. Is that fair? Yes. And in, in fact, I, I think... The longer Jim Story has been on the board, the more he has consolidated the power. So uh, kind of before Story became the board chairman, it was common amongst the board members to s every two years to switch who the board chairman was. And ever since Jim Story has been the board chairman, he has been the board chairman. Oh, so he's the board of head of the board of commissioners and has been for some time. Right? Yes, w which is actually a, a departure from tradition. Well, here's what's happened. Um, I think in, in some ways I, I would characterize that as the Board of Commissioners throwing money at my opponent to try to keep her afloat and to keep her doing well. So in the meantime, at the time that she's gone from $1.2 million to $2.1 million, she's lost 18 prosecutors and fired one more. So what is her answer? Her answer is I need more money because I'm not getting as much as similarly sized counties. I need more money. So she's going to ask the, the, the Board of Commissioners for more money. But now what happened recently, with two more prosecutors going, she would have been down to five. So here's currently right now, or to six. Currently right now, there are six assistant prosecutors, or seven. I'm sorry, seven. She has been approved for 11. So, so during this time, when she started, there were eight. The Board of Commissioners has now approved her to have 11 prosecutors 
which that's at a cost of about $120,000 or more per prosecutor, and that's forever and ever. Um, fortunately, she can't fill those spots. She had gotten up to eight, and now it's back down to seven because two quit, and one she lured back. Now, how did she lure the person to come back? Um, they were offered a considerable amount of money more to go to Ottawa County. And the next thing you know, um, this assistant prosecutor rescinds his acceptance. And uh, we found out that he has been moved up on the pay scale to the highest pay scale. So he, he received about a 20% pay increase to stay. So that happened. And now here's the interesting thing. The county board does not allow people to get merit bonuses they don't allow to give them merit raises they don't allow they have a they the prosecutor's office has a set ca uh, schedule for their salaries and it's based on how many years you've been there and they move this this uh, assistant prosecutor from the middle table all the way to the top and that's something that's not allowed for any other county um, department so it's been a special dispensation just for my opponent, and it happens right in the middle of our campaign. It happens right when I'm telling everybody she keeps losing prosecutors. And all, lo and behold, she is now given the right to now radically increase salaries to keep people staying here. And I would say that looks like election interference to me. It certainly looks like a campaign contribution to Ms. Cook yeah. by the county, by public funds. And, in fact, all my friends that work for the county, encourage your fellow co-workers to all put in your two weeks' notices at the same time and see what happens. Yeah, if all the prosecutors did that, they would all end up with 20% raises, potentially. Yeah. Uh, all my friends in the health department or, or any other departments out there, imagine that. I mean, if, if word of this gets around of how, how much favoritism that Jim Story has allowed that board to play just for the prosecutor, it, to the detriment of everybody else in the county, it, you know, mor morale might be not be very good now, but it certainly would be worse when people know that that our elected officials are playing favorites. I'm not aware of any other county uh, department whose budget has almost doubled in six years. Same. So, so I think that that is some election interference. I think that that's people carrying my opponent's water for her, throwing more money at her to try to keep her from looking like she's failing. And I think it's completely unfair and inappropriate. Now, let me tell you what else happened, and I think you know. Um, recently, there was a story that, uh, that a story about Mr. Story, where he withdrew his name from the ballot uh, for, uh, for um, Board of Commissioners. He has an opponent, Craig Van Beek, out of Hamilton, uh, on the school board there. Um, so Mr. Story, on the deadline, withdrew his name from the ballot. Uh, now he's saying that he was pressured into withdrawing and that it was, uh, uh, he, was, he shouldn't have had to withdraw. And now he's trying to get back on the ballot. Now, from what I understand, uh, he had, the reason he was going to be taken off was some, some campaign finance things that happened in 2015 when he ran for a state rep and he didn't take care of things in time uh, he's, he says that he went and paid them on, and should have been on the ballot but he voluntarily took himself off the ballot he's not on the ballot right now he is now trying to get on the ballot but what's disturbing to me is last week the board of commissioners met now there's only five commissioners uh, Mr. Story left the room for this part of the discussion, but uh, the Board of Commissioners voted to pay a private attorney $10,000 to write a position paper basically saying why Mr. Story should be put back on the ballot. Uh, did you hear about this? I did, and quite frankly, I'm still in shock that my taxpayer dollars are going to fund a commissioner's private problem a problem of his own creation something that this was a him problem this should be ten thousand dollars come out of his own personal pocket not my pocket not your pocket not any taxpayer here in allegan county's pocket but his own personal pocket because this is for his campaign to me it's 
it's a it's a it's another soft donation or maybe even a hatch act violation for the county to to do this it's but now explain different. to everybody what a hatch act violation would be so the hatch act basically uh public officials can't go around acting as as campaign agents uh it's a, it's an old act back from the 1930s back when when people thought that uh, FDR was getting too much power, essentially, uh, and basically looking like, uh, hey, we're, we're the party that you can count on in, in government and, you know, basically acting as the government as a party. Yeah. And so that's, it, it's, a, it's a line that, that gets blended, especially when there's federal dollars at play here. And certainly the county is a recipient of federal dollars. Now, they did uh, reform the Hatch Act over the years. Uh, to make it less onerous, but certainly it doesn't smell right. It certainly looks like a, at least a campaign contribution. Well, does it look to you like it's election interference? Because what, what, if you're, what if you're his opponent? What if you're the guy who's running against him, and all of a sudden the county board who has been with the uh, – they have the action team, which Jim Story leads the action team of the county commissioners. If the county board of commissioners is hiring private attorneys to try to force the board of elections – to put him back on the ballot, isn't that election interference? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and the fact that it 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 serves no public purpose, other than for the personal benefit of Jim Story. And here's here's the other rub is that the county board uh, has also denied uh, the county clerk, the county treasurer, and the county drain commissioner their fees in a lawsuit against the county for very legitimate reasons because the county board voted to essentially kick their offices out of the county seat. I think they even had a ridiculous ar argument to say that uh, Allegan Township was the county seat, not Allegan City, uh, or that they were the same thing of some sort. Some I think that the, my understanding is they've annexed the part of Allegan Township where the, the Dumont facilities are. So they're saying that that part of Allegan Township is actually the city of Allegan, and that's how they get around saying that county, county departments have to be in the county seat. Well, they're saying, well, since we bought this part from, from Allegan Township and annexed it, and it's, it's now actually Allegan 10 miles away. <laughs> and so that's, that's what they're saying. So they, they've uh, refused to pay the attorney fees for, uh, for county officials who are actually fighting in a, in a county fight. And yet they have p chosen to pay $10,000 for a, a position paper that basically only benefits and can only benefit uh, Jim Story. Yes, and personally and his campaign at that. Well, it'll be interesting to see if they count it as a campaign by, uh, contribution. I, I highly doubt it. But Mr. Story seems to have some problems with abiding by campaign finance laws, we can see from his record. Well, yeah, we, we found another thing where um, in 2015 he had a different problem where uh, 33 years earlier he had had the same situation where he didn't uh, do his paperwork correctly and had to pay a $2,500 fine before he could get on the ballot in 2015 as well from a 1980-something uh, violation. Yeah, I think maybe that's, oh, that's it, popped up on the screen there. Yep. Uh, back when uh, he was living up in the UP, apparently. Yeah. So I think here we have a situation, in, in, in my opinion, we have election interference on two, two counts. We have uh, the, the, the Board of Commissioners coming in and trying to save my opponent by allowing her to pay people more money, which is completely outside of board policy, um, and to allow her to try to save face and keep people uh, from leaving by allowing to have her pay more money. Now, it's interesting because my, my opponent has pointed out several times that uh, all across the state there are prosecutors' offices that are losing people and, and they're short-staffed. and uh, So she's trying to say that it's normal. And so I just did a little bit of checking in one of the local uh, uh, communities next door to us, and it turns out that uh, in Van Buren they've only lost a couple of prosecutors over the last six years. And during that same time, they've added three prosecutors, assistant prosecutors, that went from Allegan to Van Buren. So Al they're, they're about the same size as us, and yet they have not anywhere near the turnover. So I think it's a far stretch for somebody to say, because there's a shortage of prosecutors in Allegan, that's what's causing everybody to leave, and that's, it's just not true. 
she's she said she has no shortage of prosecutors. She just has a shortage of being able to keep them. And so I think that the, the there's been some election um, interference in in my race, and I certainly think there's election interference in uh, the race that for board of commissioners uh, for Jim Story and Craig Van Beek. So I think today that's about what we wanted to talk about. So I, I appreciate you coming in, Kevin. Yeah, and you know, and, and more importantly, not 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 only is it election interference, but it's a waste of public taxpayer dollars. Yep. To benefit people personally, which is really disgusting. But I'm I'm still waiting for the county to give me ten thousand dollars for my campaign. I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> All right. So hopefully you can join us again when we do our next podcast. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. All right. Thank you.